Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, those silent flocks by night. All throughout the heavens, they'll show the holy light. So, so go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Well, good morning. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. And we welcome those of you who are joining us online today as well. Today we are wrapping up our series uh, that we've been in through Advent and through Christmas. It's called uh, Keeping Christmas. And today we're wrapping it up with Keeping Christmas Going. And so we're glad to have you with us today. If you're joining us in person today, the ushers will come around in just a moment with the red attendance pads. We hope that you'll take a minute let us know that you've been here. If you're online with us, we hope that you'll take a minute and uh, you can do the same thing. You can let us know that you've, you're here at medfordumc.org Sunday. It's also a great place to learn a little bit more about our ministry. You can connect to our Facebook and uh, social media pages. You can uh, make a gift. You can submit a prayer request. You can also find a place to download the app as well. So we hope that you'll take a minute, explore that. And if you're here in the room, you can scan the QR code in the back of the seat and uh, you can get connected to us that way as well. So I think we just have one quick announcement. Danielle, if you want to talk a little bit about the blood drive. Good morning. Um, we are getting ready to host our first Red Cross blood drive of, two, of 2024 this Thursday from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. right here in the FLC. As of about 15 minutes ago, we had 10 slots left. So let's start off the new year by helping to save three lives through your one donation. If you have any questions, see me after the service, visit the church website, or you can check the weekly newsletter for specifics of how to sign up. Thank you. Yeah. Nate, I think we're ready. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year's Eve. It's so great to be gathered together. Um, why don't we stand together and lift our voice? Together. Good news of great joy for every woman, every man. This will be a sign to you, a baby born in Bethlehem. Come and worship, do not be afraid. A company of angels. Glory in the highest, and on the earth peace among those on whom all 
We won't be quiet today, right? Ah! <laughs> Come on up. Ah! Come on. Too loud. But the song said we won't be quiet. Huh? The song said we won't be quiet. What do you think? We're going to make some noise. We're going to praise, right? So how was Christmas? Good? Had a fun time? Are you worn out? Yeah? It is, it is kind of tiring, isn't it? So, well, who do you think gets most tired? Hmm? Young people or old people? Yeah. Young? I don't know. Old. Yeah, I'm really tired. And you know, your moms and dads are going to hear a story today from the Bible about two old people. You know, last Sunday we celebrated Jesus' birthday, right? Now, about, oh, five or six weeks later, after Jesus' birth, his parents took him to the temple to dedicate him to God. And while they were there, there was this old man named Simeon, and they said he was a righteous man. And he came up to Mary and Joseph, and guess what he did? Anybody have any idea what he, what he did? Think, what do you think? What, what? You think? Well, somewhat like that. He told them about their, he took their baby in his arms. He took Jesus in his arms. And he told Mary and Joseph Jesus was going to do some great things. And he was so happy to see Jesus because God had told him he wasn't going to go to heaven until he saw the Messiah. So he got to see him. So he's really happy. He's praising God, just like the song was saying. But he wasn't the only person there. There was an 84-year-old woman there. And she came up. Her name was Anna. And she looked at Jesus, and she started praising God and telling everybody about him. So big day, huh? Big day at the temple that day. Everybody's talking about Jesus. Now, I have a question for you. See, Anna and Simeon both knew Jesus was going to do something big. Something new was going to happen. No. What? You have something? No? Okay. They, they know. Did any of you see the movie The Santa Claus? Or The Santa Claus 2? Yeah, you saw that? Okay, I got a question for you. Anybody recognize this guy with the beard? Huh? Who do you think that is? Huh? Santa? No, but he's around Santa. In the movie, they were called the legendary figures. Now, this one over here is Jack Frost. Huh? Jack Frost didn't like, like being Jack Frost. And over here is Mother Nature. And over here, this guy with the white beard, let me see. Let me try another one here. I'm sorry, my printer ran out of ink when I was doing this. Oh, there he is again. Or, let's see here. I have a color picture here. Yeah. I don't know 
let's see here. How about, is that better? Anybody have any idea who he is? The guy with the beard. No? Mm, not Lord of the Rings. Oh, did you ever hear of Father Time? No, you never heard of Father Time? Well, Father Time is that old man with the beard. How about that? And he reminds us of time. Usually he carries an hourglass, or sometimes he carries this thing that they used to harvest grain. It's on a long stick with a curved blade. And that reminds us that at some point in time, it's our time to go. But Father Time has a big day too. Anybody have any idea what Father's Time big, big day is? What do you think? We might be thinking about it today. Oh, hmm? New Year's Day. Oh, New Year's Day. Exactly. Right. That is so good. Now, we're on New Year's Eve, right? What do we do New Year's Eve? Oh, okay. We're, we're gonna, you watch the ball drop. You play yeah. with pads? Pants. Pants. Oh, okay. Yeah, pants. You make lots of noise, huh? <laughs> Anything else you do on New Year's Eve? Yes. You do what? Fireworks. Okay. Now, here's what I used to do as a kid. You can't really do this too much anymore in any town. <laughs> we used to fire off shotguns. Yeah, we used to fire off shotguns. Make a lot of noise. Wake people up, huh? Are you guys going to stay up all night and watch the ball drop? Yeah? Got to stay up? Okay. So this is the big day. Now, besides watching fireworks, besides having parties and watching the ball drop, what's something else people do around New Year's Eve? Yeah. Eat. They eat, right? Now, what, how am I going to phrase this? Let's see. If you eat too much, what do you think you have to do? Go to the doctor? Go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. OK. Yep. Yep. Got to do that. OK. Anything else? Did you ever hear about resolutions? Yeah? yeah. You've heard the word? What do you think a resolution is? Yes. Something you want to get better at. Like I said, if you eat too much, like I have been doing re recently, you know what I have to do? I have to eat less. Go on a diet. Start to exercise. Yeah, work out. You're exactly right. I really have to do that. Treadmill. Yes. And what else? Lift weights. Yeah, exactly. I was doing that really good until a couple of months ago. Then I stopped. And I gained weight. So I had to make a resolution. I have to gain weight. But you think of any other kinds of resolutions we might make? Yeah. Doing? Get better grades at school, okay. There's all kinds of resolutions you can make. Now, I thought because of New Year's Eve and we call it a party time, would it be nice to invite Jesus to the party? Yeah. yeah, think so? Okay. Well, let's see here. I'm going to bring this out here. And you said this was too noisy, so I'll keep this back here. How's that? Huh? Too noisy? All right. Everybody take one of these. Whoops. Everybody grab a bag. Okay, in the bag, you'll find a hat. Put on a party hat. You know, I saw people on TV this morning with party hats on. Huh? Do one. And here you go. All right. I dropped that. And here you go. And we got a little guy over here. Let's see here. There you go, buddy. Huh? Grab that. Okay, now let's see here. I, bet, I guess I better get a bag too here, huh? All right, so let's find our party hat. You got green for the Eagles? Okay, green for the Eagles. Purple, I got purple. All right, here we go. I have purple. You know, I don't think Matt's going to go. Another one? Wait, I think I can pick 
stuff. So it's a little loose by putting it in here. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I don't understand. Don't worry. Make it easy. We're gonna be doing for Eagles too. Are you an Eagles fan? Okay. So there's a lot of stuff in this site. Got the hats, right? Now here's a here's a thing. I think tell me which was. Which way this is the boy stick. Yeah, it's the boy stick. But you know, I thought I thought this thing would be really neat to put on like refrigerators or someplace so we could see it. Remember the West Dodge like sign. Okay, just go to the box there. Thank you. Now, I've got another thing here. See this little book? This book has a lot of neat stuff in it to do. You get the colors and stuff, and there's a word sign. This one has a thing. How can you help somebody else out this year? How can you do something nice for somebody? And you can draw stuff. And dot here's dot one. Dot to dot. Huh? Dot to dot? Maybe. Look at this one. I'm going to read this first for you. Listen to this first. Oh, nobody can hear me, can they? I don't have the microphone. This says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All right. Looks good. Mine won't fit on here. How about I just put it like this and hold it there? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, mine broke. Mine broke right off. Now, here's the last thing. In there, there's also your horn. Are you going to blow, blow, blow the horn? Let's blow the horn. Let's blow the horn. And we can say, Happy New Year, Jesus, right? Now, now, if you get tired of doing this for New Year's, you can use these to go duck hunting. Huh? All right? Now, I got something else. Did you find something else? Yeah, because, you know, I remember, I remember last, last week, uh, Miss Bethany had all kinds of streamers and stuff. And, and I was thinking, you know what you see at New Year's? Confetti, right? But I thought if I made a lot of confetti, it'd be a big mess, and it, our custodian wouldn't appreciate that. So we got bubbles. So, should we take out our bubbles? Take out the bubbles? Huh? Little bubbles? Huh? All right. And we're celebrating New Year's with Jesus. All right. So, guys. You can take all this this with you, and you can go back. You can you can play with the books, and I will say we might want to keep quiet in the horns a little bit, okay, so we can hear Pastor Joe. Yeah. Now, I just hope these things are going to encourage you to have a new relationship with Jesus and grow with Jesus this year. So, do you think that that can happen? Good idea. Yeah. All right, should we have a prayer? Okay, let's let's pray now. This prayer. I was thinking about what Pastor Joe's been telling us. He was saying, let's keep Christmas simple, right? What's Christmas all, ab all about? God coming near to us and us drawing near to God and others. So the words of this prayer are going to be pretty simple. And some of these words, I think a lot of your parents and some other adults are going to remember. Some came from the 13th century, but others we didn't really, I didn't know about it until... A musical came out in the early 70s. So, shall we pray together? We can repeat after me. Let's say, Jesus, we are so glad you were born to bring us light and salvation. We thank you for all your love and for the blessings and guidance you give us each day. In this new year of 2024, may we grow to know you more clearly, to love you more dearly, 
and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Well, guys, it's been great celebrating New Year's with you, and I hope you have a great New Year's, and you'll get to know Jesus more this year. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye-bye. You go back to the kids' corner. Sure. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, beginning with verse 25. A man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was righteous and devout. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that they could do what was customary under the law. Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. He said, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed by what was said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This boy is a sign to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that generates opposition, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your innermost being too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher. She was very old. After she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. She was now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshipped God with fasting and prayer night and day. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We pray with me. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the opportunity we have once more to think about what it is that you have to say to us, especially as we uh, enter into a new year and a new season and we make uh, resolutions and um, make commitments to one another. God, we are grateful for the way that you are at work around us, that you make things new for us every single day. And we pray that as we think together about these things, that you might be present in our midst. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The longer I do this job, the more that I'm convinced that the church is full of atheists. Now, not just folks in the pews, but actually among the clergy, too. So, I hope that I have your attention when I say that. But I don't want to go there quite yet. Because first, I want to talk about the two people in our story today. Simeon and Anna, both older folks, both had seen their share of New Year's days come and go. And in that time, they certainly had seen their own shares of heartache as well. We know, for example, that Anna was a longtime widow, probably for over 60 years she had been widowed. And yet both of these figures who come and praise Jesus and celebrate alongside his parents in the temple they hold on to this common hope. They're both holding on, in the language of this translation, to a hope for the restoration of Israel. Now, that word restoration, in other translations, sometimes it's the consolation of Israel. So, I don't know if you know the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. You know, there's a line in there that talks about Israel's strength and consolation. It's kind of pointing to this idea. Um, and it's a word that if you dive into its meaning, you know, in Greek, which is the language that the New Testament is written in, you find that there is this connection between this word consolation and the word that gets used for the Holy Spirit, especially in John's gospel. 
And that word, um, parakletos, is the word. In this instance, it's actually paraklesis. But in Greek, literally what that means is to summon someone to your side, to call someone to come and, and be with you, essentially. So it's a call for help. So Simeon and Anna are waiting for God to show up at their side. Now, this plea, this expectation of consolation, it had been long-standing. How long-standing? Well, if I had to guess, I'd say something on the order of 600 years. At least since the time of the exile, when the people in and around Jerusalem were carried into captivity by the Babylonians. And that region was then ruled by a series of empires that came, invaded, conquered, held Israel kind of in check, didn't allow them very much autonomy, didn't allow them the ability to, uh, to govern themselves. The people had been praying for a savior for at least as long as that. And that's about 600 years. It's a long time to wait for an answer to prayer. And you can see now how a wait that long might push some people in the direction of atheism. I mean, how long have you waited for certain prayers to be answered? What's the longest that you've ever spent praying for something? When prayers go unfulfilled for that long, it can bring us right up to the precipice of atheism. And I will come back to that idea, but not quite yet. Because we need to say just a little bit more about Simeon and Anna. Simeon, the scripture says, was a righteous man. The Holy Spirit rested on him. And that idea that the Spirit was just resting on him. There's an idea from the Hebrew Bible that the Holy Spirit was, could possess someone, that somebody would be so filled with God's presence that you could only see God in them. I can't think of anyone else in the New Testament who's described this way as being so filled with the Holy Spirit that it rests on them as their way of being. Simeon must have been something truly special to be described this way. God had promised him, and I don't know by what means or at what point in his life, but he had been promised that he would not die until he saw God's Messiah. Anna too. She prayed and she fasted and she was determined that she would see the redemption of Israel. Now, I'm sure that there were many in Jesus' time who prayed, just like Simeon and Anna did. Lord, let me see your Messiah come, because that was a common prayer. In fact, every day in the uh, synagogue, this was part of the prayers that people would pray. But just as you know, we also pray a similar prayer here every single time we gather. Maybe some of you pray it every day. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of us pray these kinds of forward-looking prayers, anticipating that God one day will do something. But in reality, how many of us actually believe those prayers that we pray? Don't we just kind of go through the motions? Yes, there is this expectation that something will happen out here in the future. At some point, God will show up. But the difference for Simeon and Anna was that they actually believed it. They actually trusted in it. They actually expected it. They knew that somewhere, sometime, some way, 
God was going to meet them where they were. And they were looking for God to do that. How many of us actually live that way? So over the past few weeks, you know, we've been talking about how it is that we keep Christmas well. And when we think about how we keep Christmas going, I'd say the biggest part of that is how do we live with this expectation? How do we live with the expectation that God is actually doing something in the world around us? That this child who was born in Bethlehem is still here. That's the biggest challenge that we face. Because we get to Christmas, which the baby is born, right? So much for that. But how is it that we keep living with this expectation that God is about to do something? Because you know, if you've had kids, you go home from the hospital, you don't just, you know, okay, well, that was a thing that we did. No, the expectation continues and grows and shifts and changes and requires this thing of you now. And in five years requires a different thing of you. And in 20 years requires a different thing yet again. It's not as though we can just come to the place where we celebrate a birth and that's it, we're done. Instead, there's an expectation that something more will take place. Do we really believe that? That's the question. Or instead, do we mostly live as kind of functional atheists, not necessarily intellectual atheists? So if I asked you, do you believe in God, presumably you would probably say yes, but functionally, in terms of the way that you actually go about your daily life, maybe if we actually explored how we lived, the answer to that question would be somewhat less obvious as to whether or not we live as though we believe in God. So there's a writer, his name is Parker Palmer, and he might have been the one to coin this phrase, uh, functional atheism. He's got several great books, and there's one in particular that's about vocation. It's about um, finding what it is God has, has created you to do. It's a great book. It's called Let Your Life Speak. And in that book, he talks about this idea of functional atheism like this. The belief that ultimate responsibility for everything rests with us. This is the unconscious, unexamined conviction that if anything decent is going to happen here, we are the ones who must make it happen. That's a conviction that's held by people who talk a good game about God. Does that idea resonate with you? Do you see yourself in that? This idea that we profess our belief, but we don't actually leave room in our lives for an expectation that God is going to do something. I mean, I certainly see this in myself, that on a personal level, I have trouble even sitting still for five minutes to let God speak into my life, to really be quiet and listen. I see it in all kinds of ways as we lead the church, not just myself, but clergy in general, that we are very busy studying the models of church that are working today studying how it is that we lead to the best of our ability. But in reality, the times that I remember where God has been most present, most active, most real, have been in those moments when things were absolutely out of my control. When things were, in fact, kind of chaotic where things were happening, and I wasn't trying to control them. Sometimes the best spiritual discipline for us is actually to lose control. I know of a number of pastors I've spoken with people through the years 
who have said things to me like, you know, I never really knew who God was until I went through XYZ crisis. Typically, it's a health crisis where they find God kind of in the hospital room after they've come to the end of their rope. What does it say about us that the only time that we're able and willing to make space for God is when that space is kind of forced upon us? The God that we worship wants us to be free, but doesn't want us to be independent. The God that we worship answers our prayers, but only when we take the time to listen. The God that we worship hears our cries for help, comes alongside us in our need, but only when we're willing to pause and see God in the faces of those who show up for us in those moments. That's what Christmas is about. That's what we talked about. God comes alongside us, taking on human form, so that God can fully identify and understand what it is that we're about, what it means to be human, so that God can love us in all the ways that go beyond simply this kind of intellectual connection, intellectual admiration, but engaging in one another's lives. So for 2024, can we make a resolution? Can we make a resolution not to live as functional atheists, but instead looking to these characters, Simeon and Anna, looking to them as our models, their conviction that God is real, that God, when called, will show up and do something, that God will keep promises, even if it takes 600 years, God will keep promises to us. Simeon and Anna were not playing at living in God's presence. They weren't playing at serving God. They weren't playing at having faith. And neither should we. We don't get to this place where we celebrate Christmas. We bring the baby home from the hospital, right? And then just walk away. Like, well, that was a nice thing we did. That's not how this works. And so keeping Christmas is not just about having the faith to welcome Jesus into the world. It's about making space in our hearts for this expectation that God will continue to show up at any time and in any place. Because if God cared enough to step into this world 2,000 years ago, I have to believe that God continues to show up day by day and month by month and year by year. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful for everything that you've done for us. We are grateful for the opportunity to live in your presence, to know that you have given yourself to be present with us, we ask that today we might create space in our hearts and our minds for you to continue to act, knowing that we don't have to do everything, but that we can trust you to fulfill your promises, that we can trust you to show up, to come alongside us, to love us, to serve us, that just as we serve you, God, we are grateful for all the ways that you have come into this world and all the ways that you continue to promise your presence now and in all the days to come. We ask all of this, pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.
friends, there are just a few hours left in 2023, just a few hours left to help us uh, to be able to make sure that we close out this year uh, strong financially. And so we are really grateful for all your support. On Christmas Eve, we announced the $15,000 uh, Match and Gifts Challenge, and I'm really excited to say that we've met that challenge. So we are incredibly grateful for your gifts. And um, we still have a little ways to go in terms of, to get to, in terms of getting to where we'd like to be. Um, so if you would like to make a gift today, we would uh, welcome that. You can drop a gift in the, in the offering baskets. You can also uh, make a gift right up to midnight uh, through the app or through the website at medfordumc.org slash give. And uh, we are thankful for all the ways that you uh, just give of yourselves, not only in terms of uh, showing up here on Sunday mornings, helping with the kids, uh, helping us to be able to serve in the community, um, taking care of things like the Angel Tree Gifts and the Bridges of Hope Project and all of these kinds of ministries that, uh, that we carry out through the year. So I thank you. We are grateful for you. And uh, just God bless you as you continue into this new year. Let's take some time together to pray. And as we do that, I'll uh, leave some space for you to lift up your concerns, uh, either for people, for situations, as we pray, uh, as we're online, we uh, encourage you to, uh, if you're online with us today, we encourage you to lift up your prayers uh, through the chat, and so we encourage you to do that uh, using first names only, please. I think that we have a prayer from the uh, control room this morning, so let's share that prayer. Amen. So I think that if I heard right, I think that Mickey today wants to give thanks uh, for his girlfriend, and uh, we want to give thanks alongside you uh, for her, and we want to give thanks for all those that we love today. So as we uh, prepare to pray together, let's take just a couple of deep breaths and uh, in quiet, welcome God into this place and into our hearts. God, as we are gathered here on the close of one year and the start of a new one, we know that the change in the calendar doesn't necessarily mean that much unless we commit to live differently. And we do that in all kinds of different ways. Some of us make commitments to live healthier lives. Some of us will make commitments to draw closer to family, to start something new, to learn something new, to chase after something that we have long dreamed of. We pray that today for each one of us that part of that commitment that we make might be to live in the expectation that when we pray, that when we serve, that when we offer ourselves to you, that you will show up and that you will meet us, that you will lead us, and that you will guide us. And so as we are gathered here, we just pray that you might continue to make yourself known. We lift up our prayers uh, for the world that we live in, for the people of Gaza, for Israel, for those who live in the West Bank, 
for Ukrainians and for Russians. Lord, we pray that your peace might find a place and that leaders of this world might learn to pursue peace, to chase after it, that it's something that is worth pursuing for the sake of people everywhere. God, as we are gathered, we know that there are people that we are thinking about, members of our families, our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors. And so I invite you to lift up those names today, right now. God, we thank you that when we lift up our voices to you, that you hear us. And for each one of those that we've named, whatever their need, whatever their situation, we pray that you might be present. And we expect you to be present. We pray that as we take our leave from this place and go back out into the world, that we might do that with room in our hearts, to expect and anticipate and look for and acknowledge your presence in the world around us. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you're able, please stand with us.
friends, go forth with the expectation that God is still doing something in the world. Go forth leaving room and space in your hearts to see, to hear, to understand what it is that God is doing right now in the midst of your life. Go forth in the name, the power, the grace of Jesus Christ.